It's good to see you here today. I want you to take your Bibles, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to deal with a topic today called about the Lord's Supper. I want to talk about this uh, important topic. So, uh, so look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that deals with this issue. I think I'm going to move this here for me this morning. It might be a little easier. So... 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I want to deal with this uh, topic on the Lord's Supper uh, because I think it is an important thing for Christians to understand. It's a very special time in the church. It's a holy time of worship where we fellowship with the Lord, I think, in a very special way. And uh, the Lord's Supper has kind of been a monumental issue throughout the history of the church. There's been a lot of uh, ink spilled on over this issue um, by different scholars on different sides of the issue, even more so than the issue of justification by faith or the authority of Scripture. And not only has there been ink spilled over this issue, believe it or not, there has been blood spilled over this issue. Did you know that throughout the history of the church, there have been men who were martyred over this doctrine of the Lord's Supper and what it actually is and what it is not. Men like uh, uh, Cranmer and, Rid and Latimer and Ridley, these were men who were burned at the stake because they denied the Catholic idea of the Lord's Supper, which is, um, we'll look at it here in just a minute, of transubstantiation. And they wanted to hold to the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. And so uh, you don't give your life for secondary matters, do you? You only give your life for things that are very important. And these were men who uh, died over this issue. And so it's very, very important. And I think that um, many don't see this as something that is significant. Uh, many people don't really understand the importance of the Lord's Supper. Less than 20% of churches have communion more frequently than four times a year. And so a lot of churches really don't value it. They don't really think much of it. So let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Let's, let's, let's talk about what it actually means and the different views and the practical use it has for the church and how we should value it and hold it as believers in the church. Well, first of all, in the first century, the early Christians, did you know that they were persecuted because of the way that they, they had, uh, held the Lord's Supper? They were persecuted by the Romans. The Romans even accused the Christians of practicing cannibalism, eating flesh, because they didn't really understand what the believers were doing uh, when they were practicing the Lord's Supper. Um, because the, the Christians, they talked about eating the body and drinking the blood. You know, remember that passage in John chapter 6 where he said to the people, except you eat my body and drink my blood. But Jesus wasn't being literal there, was he? He was, he was using a figurative expression to talk about how that he would provide spiritual sustenance and nourishment. So when the Christians began talking about this, the, the Romans were taking them literally. And because they were uninformed, they thought that they were literally eating people. And so they were calling the Christians cannibals which was a misunderstanding, a major misunderstanding. And so some of the Romans found that the celebration of this Lord's Supper by Christians was worrisome and very, very strange. But the truth of the matter is, even if an, a non-believer comes into the church today and has never really been a part of any church tradition in their background, and they're here on the Sunday when we do the Lord's Supper, you can imagine how strange they might think it would be, right? I mean, we eat this little piece of bread, and uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we drink this little cup of juice, and then we call it supper. I mean, you know, most people wouldn't call that supper, right? So for an unbeliever coming in here and watching us do that, uh, they would wonder, what, what's going on there? What are they doing? And then even new believers sometimes about the Lord's Supper uh, might have questions. Even if they go through a beginner's class, they still, perhaps there are things they don't understand. But I would add to that, even lifelong Christians may be surprised to learn views of different Christian groups with respect to the Lord's Supper. This is not a common meal, obviously. It's not, it's, it's not something that is, you know, uh, typical. It is something that is very sacred. It is a time of fellowship, a time of reflection, remembering, and so on. And so it's also related to how Christians understand Jesus and we understand his earthly ministry. And so understanding then the meaning of the Lord's Supper, 
And understanding the importance of it in the life of the church, I think, will help us to better understand the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to talk about today are just several questions we want to answer with respect to the Lord's Supper. First of all, we want to say, what is the Lord's Supper? And then we want to talk about why celebrate the Lord's Supper? Why do we do it? And then the practice, the various practices among Christians about this. And then one big question that is asked with reference to the Lord's Supper is, is Christ present in the bread and the wine? How is Christ present at the Lord's Supper? We'll look at the main views about that. And then if we have time, we'll, we'll try to just address some practical questions with reference to this a very important ordinance and institution that the Lord gave. So what is the Lord's Supper? What is it? Now, obviously, we know that this was something that Jesus instituted. And you remember that was during the Passover meal. That was the night before Jesus was crucified when he had all of his disciples together. Um, he, was, he was observing the Passover meal. And we know that Passover speaks about what? It speaks about when God's people, the Hebrews, the Jews, were delivered out of slavery in Egypt. And you all know the story, I'm sure, how that on the night of the Passover, God sent the death angel and all those homes that did not have the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and side posts um, over the top of the door and on the side, if they did not have the blood of the lamb, then the firstborn inside that home, what, died, right? But for those who did have the blood of a lamb, of a, a lamb that was a male lamb that was without blemish, if the person did have the blood on the doorpost, then the death angel passed over. And so God then uh, said that they are to commemorate this event with a Passover supper, um, every year, unleavened bread and the Passover lamb to be eaten to commemorate this event. So, of course, Jesus was doing that at, at the night before he was betrayed. And what he did was he transformed that Passover meal into what we now know as the Lord's Supper. Uh, and so Jesus, during that meal, used the imagery of bread and of wine to really speak about himself as the real Passover lamb. He would be the fulfillment of that um, lamb. That lamb s spoke figurative, figuratively and prophetically of Jesus Christ himself. And so Jesus commanded his followers to continue to celebrate uh, this supper. Now, Paul explains this a little bit. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would. And look down at verse number 23. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. You all there? Look what it says in verse 23. For I, I, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me me. And so in verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. And so this was the commandment that Jesus gave. And Paul says, I'm simply passing on to you, to the Corinthians, this ordinance, this commandment that the Lord Jesus gave. Now, did you notice that uh, this one thing that two of the main celebrations in the Bible when you think about it, the Passover in the Old Testament and the Lord's Supper in the New Testament are centered on what? On meals. Did you know that, you know, we, we kind of treat meals, you know, in a, maybe a careless way nowadays. But did you know that it was not so in the biblical days? A meal was something that was, that was spiritual, really, when you think about it. And by the way, we're all going to have a meal this week, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about this, this in the morning worship service, but I think that um, we're getting away from the spiritual significance of that meal. It's becoming too secularized. When it was originated, and, and again, we'll talk about this, when the, uh, the, the American pilgrims who were Puritans, who were strong believers in the Bible and loved the Old Testament. In fact, William Bradford was a, um, a strong believer in 
understanding these Old Testament books. And he studied, did you believe, you believe this? He studied Hebrew on the Mayflower on the way over. I learned this when I was in seminary studying Hebrew. I was doing some research and found out that all the, all the stuff I was working on and studying, he was doing that in a boat on the way over. So I had nothing to complain about. And uh, he loved the, the imagery of the Old Testament. And I think the Thanksgiving meal actually came out of his study of the Old Testament. And we'll look at that this morning in our worship service. But when you think about it, meals in the scripture have a very spiritual significance to it. Many of our fondest memories and relationships tend to be formed around the sharing of food. Remember that verse in Revelation where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and will sup with him, have dinner with him, and he with me. There's a sense in which sitting down and having a meal and having fellowship is a very significant, it's a very spiritual event. And so um, meals allow us to develop relationships with others. God invites us to a special relationship with him. And uh, think about the feasts in the Old Testament. There are many feasts that are talk about, talked about in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. Um, we get to know God during these special meals in a special way. When we share a meal with others with gratitude to God, we really, we humbly recognize our dependence on the goodness of God, don't we? We recognize that all that we have is really of the Lord. And when you think about it, meals address really the basic human needs that we have. Food for hunger, water for thirst. In our daily meals, we remember that we're thankful to God for his goodness, for his provision in our lives. And so because these um, things like food and drink are so close to our most basic needs, they become images, exceptional images for our most basic spiritual needs. Our, our most basic physical needs, of course, are food and drink. But what's our most basic spiritual needs? It's forgiveness of sin and fellowship with God, to be reconciled to God and with other people. God didn't create us to be alone, to live alone. He created us to, to live in harmony with relationships with other people. And so all of this speaks about the spiritual nourishment that God gives us. Now, there's the basic names for this in the New Testament. It's called the breaking of bread. In the time of the apostles, this was what was used because whenever a family got together and had a fellowship meal, they called it the breaking of bread. Uh, Jesus instituted, of course, the Lord's Supper, at the end of the Passover meal, as we already saw. And sharing a meal then creates this sense of belonging and unity. You remember in Acts, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. That spoke about the Lord's Supper there and to prayer. Also, some people call it Holy Communion. Um, Paul writes about the communion of the body and the blood. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You're in 1 Corinthians, but look in chapter 10 and look at verse number 16. Notice what it says there. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? It's interesting that it uses the word communion there. And the word for communion is the Greek word, um, koinonia, which speaks of a two-sided relationship. It's a sharing of, of fellowship, um, participation. It's translated that way uh, many times, and it refers to the communion um, among believers because, you know, there's one loaf, and we who are many are one body, and we all partake. Look at verse 17 of chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians. He says, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. In other words, what he's saying is that there's a wonderful demonstration of unity and oneness in the Lord's Supper, because if you hear, here you have one loaf, and if everybody takes one piece of that loaf, we all have an individual piece, yet it comes from the same loaf. So there's, it, it portrays unity there. We are, we are many, but yet we're all one, just like the bread. And so that's what he's speaking about there in verse number 17. It also refers to the believer's union with 
Christ. Um, as we saw, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So think about this. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, what's he, do, what's he doing there? The context of this is that Paul is actually rebuking some of the Christians who were actually going to the, a, a, a temple where there was an idol that was worshipped. And they were actually sitting down in the temple. And a lot of these ancient temples, they had dining rooms. And people would take meat that was sacrificed to an idol. And then they would eat that meat. And they would sit down together. And they would begin to eat the, the meal together. And uh, Paul was rebuking some Christians that were still doing that. And he says, you know, when you do that, don't you understand that basically you're having fellowship with uh, devils? Um, that you're um, having fellowship with demons when you do that. Now, remember that there was an issue about eating meat sacrificed to idols. There was something that was questionable. You see, if, if meat sacrificed to an idol was sold in the meat market and Christians would go and they would buy that meat and take it home and cook it and eat it, there was nothing wrong with that. Paul said you had the liberty to do that unless it caused another believer to stumble. You don't want to do this if it's going to cause another believer to stumble. But other than that, you have liberty to do that. That was a questionable practice that a believer could have liberty to do if they felt they could. What was not questionable, what was obviously wrong, is when a believer would actually go to that idol's temple and then sit down in the temple and then eat meat in the temple. That was wrong. That was not questionable. And Paul made it very clear. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look down in verse number um, 20. But I say that the thing which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would that ye should not have fellowship with devils. Verse 21, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do you, you pro provoke the Lord to jealousy? In other words, here's the point. He says to those believers there, look, if you go to that temple and you eat that meat and you're there in that temple, don't you know that you're fellowshipping with these devils? Koinonia. Now, apply that same principle to the Lord's Supper. When we come to God's house and we partake of the Lord's Supper, we on the, in contrast, are fellowshipping with who? With the Lord. That's the point there. You see the connection? So we're not just eating bread and drinking juice. We're fellowshipping. Koinonia. There's a communion that takes place there between the believer and uh, the Lord. And it speaks about our union with Christ. That's why the word communion there, the Greek word koinonia, is such a strong word. Now, again, we're talking about names for this celebration. It's called the Lord's Table. And again, Paul uses this expression in the celebration of the Lord's Supper with, with, with the pagan sacrifice. This is common in his time. He's contrasting that. Uh, the, the pagan celebrations included food, sacrifice to their gods, and abundant wine. And often those celebrations ended in drunkenness and debauchery. And you know what the Corinthians were doing? They were actually doing that at the Lord's Supper. They were mistakenly using the same paradigm that the, that the pagans did on their celebrations and bringing it into God's house. And they were carelessly celebrating the Lord's Supper. They would actually have what they called an agape feast. This was characteristic in the first century church. It was a love feast. In other words, it's just like what we do today. We have a, we have a potluck. Remember these potluck dinners we have? Why do we call it luck, by the way? We're Christians, man. We, we, we don't believe in luck. I mean, if we're going to call it anything, we should call it pot faith right? Let's have a pot faith fellowship. Because um, it takes faith to eat some of what, no, I'm just kidding. And, uh, but anywho, I'm just teasing. It's always good. Uh, but that's what they would do in the first century church. They would all bring some, everybody would bring something and they would all come together and they would have this wonderful fellowship meal. And then right after that, Right on the heels of that, they would culminate their fellowship together by having the Lord's Supper. And what was happening in the church at Corinth was 
they were having this feast, but two things were happening. Number one, the rich were shaming the poor in the church. You know how they were doing that? They were, the rich were taking their food and setting it aside. And they were saying to the poor that were coming, you can't have our food. You have your own food. And they were shaming the, their brothers, the poor. And that's what made Paul angry. And then at the end, they were supposed to take the Lord's Supper. How can you take the Lord's Supper when you're showing such division in the church? Let me tell you something. There should be no segregation in the church ever. We are all one in Christ. We are absolutely, totally one. No matter who you are or where you're from or what your background is, we are all absolutely one in the body of Christ. But that was what was going on at the church at Corinth. And Paul got angry about that. Because they were, ha- and because they were, they were, had devolved into drunkenness, and then they pretended to take the Lord's Supper. And that's why Paul, look in First Corinthians chapter eleven. Look what he says to them in verse seventeen. He says, "Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not." Now in verse two, he says, "I praise you in this, brethren," but he's talking about a totally different topic now. He says, "In this thing here, I praise you not." Not very happy. Because look at verse 17. That you come together not for the better, but for the worse. You know, you can leave God's house in worse shape than when you came. That's what he's saying. You're coming together. You're not any better. It's worse. You're leaving God's house in worse shape than when you came. Because look at verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Uh, for there must be heresies among you that them which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and the other is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat it and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You're not doing good at all here. And by the way, that's why later on Paul would write and say, that's why some of you are weak and some of you are sickly and some of you sleep. They had they had taken something that was so sacred to God and to the church and it had devolved into this drunken feast where they're shaming the poor. And then they pretend to really celebrate the unity of the church by the Lord's Supper. This was a terrible thing. And Paul was writing to correct them And he writes to make sure that they know that drunkenness does not have any place at the Lord's table. You you might have done that in your old pagan life, but it has no place in the Lord's table. And uh, he says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, which we already saw that. So, again, uh, names for this. It's also called, of course, the Lord's Supper. This refers to the historical event which Jesus instituted this practice for his followers. And as we saw during the last meal, Jesus instructed his disciples about the Holy Spirit and their task um, after Jesus left. And at the end of the meal, then Jesus established and commanded the celebration of the Lord. And so, um, and so we, we saw this. So another name for this is called Eucharist. Have you ever heard that word before, Eucharist? And that's normally when you hear that word, it is uh, a word really used in, in Catholic circles about this. But really the word it comes from the Greek word. Eucharist is from the Greek word Eucharisto, which actually means thanksgiving. So it's a good word. It's a, it's a very good word. We see it a lot in the New Testament. It's a word for thanksgiving. And it's a reference to the apostles' teaching that Jesus gave thanks before uh, giving the apostles bread and wine. And in fact, we, we see that in Luke uh, where it says that on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he, Eucharisto, he gave thanks. And that's where the word comes from. Um, and so the Corinthians Christians celebrated the Lord's Supper in the context of a group meal called a love feast. I already told you about this. This is mentioned in Second Peter chapter 2 and then in Jude verse 12. And uh, after the meal, the Christians would celebrate the Eucharist by giving thanks to God for the gifts of the Lord's Supper. And this is also emphasized. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 23 and 24. Look at that real quick. Again, for I received of the Lord 
that which also I delivered unto you, that, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, verse 24, and when he had, what? Given thanks. There it is, the word, Eucharisto. When he had given thanks, um, he break it and said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now, so that's, where, that's uh, basically what the Lord's Supper is. Now, why celebrate the Lord's Supper? Um, we, we participate in it because Jesus commanded us, basically. He told us to do this in remembrance of him. And it's a reminder that just as the physical meal feeds us physically and strengthens our body, celebrating the Lord's Supper commemorates the fact that Jesus feeds us spiritually. He nourishes us spiritually, the body of Christ, Okay. It also proclaims our hope and return and our forgiveness of sin. Every time we celebrate it, it says we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he come. So we proclaim the gospel. Really, it's the gospel in visual form, and we do it until he comes. And also we're commemorating the fact that he is going to come again. It creates a strong bond of fellowship among believers when we're here. It's another form of worship, a special worship. And, of course, it's a time for, for introspection and reflection. And Paul said that. And look in uh, 1 Corinthians, um, look in verse 27 of chapter 11. He says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28, let, him, let a man examine himself. Let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So, it's a time of reflection, and again, also, it teaches new believers about who Jesus is and what he did for us, uh, and it kind of refreshes us older, mature, seasoned believers. But also, again, it fosters unity among believers, and this is the central message, the unity. In fact, you know, the Lord's Supper is important to our understanding of being a, a Christ church for worship, witness, edification, and service. First, worship. It's a way to worship Christ for his work, his grace, his love, and salvation. We participate with gratitude for what Jesus did for us. It's a witness. It's a testimony that Jesus died for our sins. He resurrected. He gives us eternal life. He will return. Remember a promise that Jesus gave to his disciples. He said this, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, Jesus made that promise. He will not drink of this cup of wine again until we are together. And you talk about a Thanksgiving meal. You know, we got one waiting in the future with the Lord. And Jesus says, I'm waiting for that. In fact, I haven't. He's on a fast. He says, I haven't. I'm not going to drink anything, any wine or any fruit of the vine until we are together there in the Lord's kingdom. Edification. In the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit minister, uh, ministers to us individually as Christ's body. And again, it's a time for mutual instruction, restoring broken relationships, forgiving past grievances, repenting of offenses against others. It's kind of like a spiritual reset button we hit. We make sure that we there's nothing between us and the Lord. All our sins are confessed as far as we know. There's nothing between us and anyone else. And also service. It's an occasion for Christians to serve each other. And that's kind of commemorated by being served in the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, sometimes people will ask us about the method. Why, why do you do this and why do you do that? And, and you're up there and you always have an usher come up and give you. Why don't you just go down and get something? Why are you so lazy standing up there? By well, it's, oh, There's a lot of symbolism in all that. It's a symbolism in just serving each other. And it's serving the body of Christ, you know. Also, it's remembering the sacrificial gift of Christ on the cross. Um, it's a powerful motivation also for us to offer ourselves just the way Jesus did. And just as we receive abundant gifts from the Lord, so do we extend this generosity to others around us. And that's why, you know, sometimes at our Lord's Supper, we, we often have an offering plate at the end, you know, because we want to give to someone else. And that all that money goes to our benevolent fund to help somebody who might have a need, a special need. And so that shows the, uh, uh, us giving to others. So let's talk about the practice among 
Christians, because there's different ways that this is practiced. Um, again, there's some unity about this. There's some things that we all agree on in the church. And one, one of the central purposes is unity. Again, it, it shows Christian unity. We have one loaf and everybody takes a piece, just like we're all members of the same body, even though we are many, same body of Christ. Okay, so we see that. Um, and, and unity, of course, is important, important to the Lord because Jesus in John 17 prayed that we would be one. We see that. And we know that. Right. The New Testament makes it clear that unity is not an option for us. It's a necessity. It's part of God's plan. And again, some important themes that we agree, agree on. We agree that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He wants his disciples to celebrate it. He made that very cl clear in Luke chapter 22. Um, and then also we agree that it shows the new covenant. You remember that God promised in the Old Testament to write his law in our heart, right? And based on the sacrifice of Christ, he does this when he forgives us of our sins, he cleanses us. But also now the, the law of God is written in our heart and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can obey God's law, which basically is culminated in the word love. But God promised to write it on our heart. And you remember that Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, the new covenant. Also, we agree on the, the, the theme of remembrance. We all agree that the Lord's Supper allows Christians to remember and celebrate Jesus' birth, life, and ministry, death, and resurrection. He said, do this in remembrance of me. We all agree on thanksgiving and fellowship and unity. All those are themes that we agree on that are all part of the Lord's Supper. We agree also that it anticipates the Lord's return. Do you know that in the Lord's Supper, we're kind of anticipating that wedding supper one day. That's what I call the ultimate Thanksgiving feast that we're all going to have. So every time we participate in the Lord's Supper, we're announcing that Christ is coming back and we're going to have supper with Jesus in heaven. Everybody understand that, right? We're going to have supper. So when we get to heaven, my first words are, you know, Jesus, this is so wonderful. This is great. What's for supper, Lord? We're all going to have supper in heaven. Okay. The angel said unto me, write this. Blessed are those that are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Are you invited? If you're saved, you are. So also another important theme is separation from sin. And again, we already saw this, that we're to examine ourselves. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 11. And we could also say another important theme is a foretaste of heaven, the celebration that we have in heaven, because Jesus said that I'm not going to drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. But here's a question I want to address in the time that we have left, because this is a controversy in a lot of places with reference to the Lord's Supper. Is, is Christ present in the bread and the wine? Thank you, brother. We can dismiss. He just, I just got the answer. Someone just said no. And, uh, but let's look at the different views on this. Again, this is one of the most controversial questions, whether or not Jesus is present. And um, for many... Um, Jesus is truly pre present at the moment of consecration and celebration of the Lord's Supper. And it's because of this special presence of Christ, the Lord's Supper is a special tool, some believe, to channel grace to us, to minister grace to us when this happens. And uh, many other Christians believe that Jesus is not present um, or we could say it like this, is neither more nor especially present. Now, we know that Jesus is present all the time with us, but is there a sense in which he's more present or especially present? That's what some would argue. Um, we know he's with us all the time in, in our worship service, and including the Lord's Supper. That's what some people would argue in this. And so Christians have tried to explain the different ways in which Christ is present or absent in the actual elements of the Lord's Supper, right? So there are basically three views to explain how Christ is present in the Lord's Supper. There's one is called transubstantiation. Another is called consubstantiation. And a third view is called the instrumental view about that. And then there's a fourth view, which attempts to explain the main function of the Lord's Supper without appealing to Christ's presence. This is called the symbolic or memorial view view. 
So let's talk about each of these views and talk about which one really is the biblical view that we hold to. First of all, there's transubstantiation. And uh, this is the view that says um, that the actual elements are transformed into the actual body and blood of Christ. All right, that some teach that. So, um, you know, so when a person in this view partakes of the actual bread and the fruit of the vine, the, the, the grape juice, when they partake of that, that they're taking into themselves the actual body and blood of Christ. And if this happens, then how does it happen? And so scholars use this word transubstantiation, and they do this to avoid two extremes. One is a crass materialism that is affirming that people actually eat flesh and blood. Or pure intellectualism, the idea that the elements are merely a sign, you see. And so this is, of course, this is the Catholic view of the Lord's Supper. And it was at the Council of Trent that they gave this. Let me just read this to you. Because Christ our Redeemer said it was truly his body and that he was offering under the species of bread, it has always been the conviction of the Church of God and this Holy Council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ of our Lord and the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change, the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and appropriately called transubstantiation. That's from the Council of Trent at their own council where they made this declaration. They say that when the priest prays the cons consecrated prayer, the prayer of consecration, at that moment when the priest prays that prayer, then the substance actually transforms. Can you believe that? That it transforms. That's what they say. And so um, now they make a distinction between accident and substance. And when we think of the word accident, we think of, you know, well, on the way home from church, I had an accident. You know, I had a little fender bender there. That's the way we think of the word accident. But that's not how it's used here in their theological language. The substance of a thing is that which makes the thing be what it is. Or we could say it is invisible to the eyes. The accidents of a thing are the visible characteristics of the thing, the color, shape, weight, and so on. And so they say that when the prayer is prayed, what changes is not the accidents of the elements, but the substance. Anybody confused? <laughs> the accidents are the same. In other words, when they pray, the bread doesn't change into a piece of flesh. You still see bread there. And the, and the, and the juice is still juice. So it's not the accidents that changes. It's the actual substance. And so according to transubstantiation, the accidents of the bread and bread will remain unchanged, but their substance changes into the body and the blood of Christ. So during the prayer, bam, the accident remains the same, but the substance changes. And this Catholic scholars speak of the substantial presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And it was Pope Pius IV that said, in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, there is truly, really, and substantially the body and blood, they say, there. And so that means that Christ is present in the underlying reality of the elements. The bread and the wine continue to be bread and wine. They're accidents while Christ's body and blood are present. They're substance. And uh, not to make light of what they're saying here, but, you know, that's why there's so many drunken priests. You say, why? Well, because if you pray and the actual grape juice becomes the blood of Christ and you have left over, what are you going to do with it? You can't just throw away the blood of Christ, can you? You can't just dump it down the drain, can you? So have a drink. You know, they drink it all up. Um, again, I don't mean to make light, but you can see how in their, <laughs> in their mind. And by the way, a lot of, I see this in a lot of Catholic um, Eucharists, they don't even do the, 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 the grape juice anymore. They just do a little wafer. Because to them now, the, if it actually becomes a literal blood of Christ, it's too holy. They're afraid somebody might spill it. So they even bypass that now. They don't even do that. 
Then there's another view that's called consubstantiation. You remember Martin Luther. You remember how he protested against the teaching of the Catholic Church. He pulled out. He saw justification by faith. But when it came to this area of the Lord's Supper, Martin Luther, he disagreed with the idea of transubstantiation. And uh, he did, however, agree that Jesus is really present in the elements of the Eucharist. However, he disagreed with the idea that the elements change in substance, as the Catholics explain, through transubstantiation. And what he did was he argued that the full bread and wine are present alongside the body and blood of Christ. They don't actually change, but alongside the actual bread and wine is the body and blood of Christ. He called this the sacramental union. And when he was questioned on any more, he refrained from giving any further explanation. Say, so this is just it right here. This is what happens. And later scholars used the concept of consubstantiation, of course, which is the prefix with. Transubstantiation is the changing of the substance. Consubstantiation is that the body and blood of Christ are with or alongside of the elements. So that's it is called consubstantiation. And it would look more like this. So during the prayer, there's just, they're side by side there is how Martin Luther explained that. And so this is the Lutheran view of the Lord's Supper. And then, of course, there's the instrumental view. And the instrumental view was really uh, made popular by John Calvin, who disagreed with the Catholic and the Lutheran scholars about Christ's real presence in the Lord's Supper. For Calvin, Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper is real, but no change of the elements occurs, he says. And so in this view, the biblical sacraments are instruments of the Holy Spirit to confer grace to the believer. So it looked more something like this. The Holy Spirit uses the bread and the wine, and through that, the, the believer is in, is, is, has grace given to him from the Holy Spirit. When we say grace, what do you mean? You know, and spiritual power, energy, you know, desire. You know, we would say it like this. How many of you ever spent a season in prayer when you got off your knees, you just felt endued with strength? Anybody ever sense that? We would call that grace. God's given us grace there. And this is what he's saying, that when you take the Lord's Supper, it's kind of an instrument that the Holy Spirit will use to confer and infuse us with a, a strength and a grace and a blessing that we receive at that point at the Lord's Supper. And he considered the doctrine of the union with Christ to be central in understanding faith in Christ. And he would say, with our, un our union with Christ is initiated in baptism. It is confirmed and sustained in the Lord's Supper. And through the elements of the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit unites us with the ascended body and blood, but not because Jesus descends into the bread and wine. Rather, the miracle of the Supper is that we are spiritually taken into heaven to commune with the Lord. That's what he says. It's not that Christ comes down. It's that we go up. There's a sense in which we are lifted up to commune with Christ during this wonderful celebration of the Lord's Supper. And then, of course, there's this symbolic or memorial view. And this is a view, of course, we believe and we take as the biblical view. And it was, it was Ulrich Zwingli, who was a pastor of the church in Zurich, during the Reformation, he disagreed with the Catholic understanding of the Eucharist, as well as that of Martin Luther and John Calvin. And... Uh, Whereas they argued for the real presence of Christ in the communion, while explaining how that happens in different ways, Zwingli disagreed that there was a quote-unquote real presence. Uh, his view, later known as the symbolic or memorial approach, says that the elements of the Lord's Supper are signs that point to the risen Christ. And they function to help us observe and remember and proclaim and worship the risen Christ. And so basically, they just simply point us to the cross. They point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, this is the view that we take and we believe. However, I would just also add to that, we do believe, of course, what the Scripture teaches, that there is a wonderful fellowship that takes place between the believer and 
the particip- uh, in the Lord Jesus at the Lord's Supper, simply because of the passage that I read to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul says, look, when you come to the Lord's table, aren't you not having communion with the body or with Jesus, we could say? He uses that word communion. There's a fellowship. And so we would say this, that of course the elements don't turn into the body and blood of Christ. And we don't hold a consubstantiation, the Lutheran view, that somehow the body and blood are somehow alongside of those elements. And um, we, we don't necessarily believe that uh, the instrumental view, although we do believe that Christ is spiritually present with us and he does bless us, but we believe, believe that the Scripture teaches that these are signs and symbols that point to the cross of Christ, that point to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a time of remembrance. It is a time of worship. There is a time of spiritual fellowship that takes place. And I would also even add to that, because we do worship the Lord, there is a sense in which God gives us grace, just like he does in any worship service that we have. We are infused with grace and strength and blessing. There's no way to meditate and think about God and not be refreshed by that, right? And not be blessed by that. And so this is the the view here. And so just in the last uh, five minutes then, the main view. So let's just go over this. We see we have the Lord's Supper and we could divide it up into two views, the sacramental and the ordinance view. The first three views are really more like a sacramental view. And the, the idea of a memorial supper and remembrance is more of an ordinance type view. Um, the Latin word sacramentum means sacred oath. It's the normal word used for translating the Greek word mysterion, mystery. And liturgical churches such as the Catholic, Lutheran, Angelic, and Ang- Anglican, Reformed, it refers to the practices the Bible prescribes through which God's grace is specially received by the participants of this uh, ceremony. Protestant churches affirm only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it's a witness to God's grace through Christ. The sacramental view, the Lord's Supper is a divine instrument to bless, nurture believers with God's grace, they say. And uh, sacraments are tied to the word of God and that the word of God validates the sacraments and made visible by the word of God. And faith in the people participating is necessary so that the sacraments, they say, can effectively communicate God's grace. Now, again, I wouldn't disagree that when we worship in the Lord's Supper, that there's a sense in which we do have grace imparted to us. We are blessed by it. Um, I wouldn't disagree with a lot of that, but I wouldn't call it a sacrament because to me that confuses where some people believe that saving grace is given in the practice of the Lord's Supper. Let me just make it very clear. You're not saved by taking the Lord's Supper. It is not a saving ordinance at all. We are already believers, and we are remembering our Lord Jesus Christ, and we enter into communion with the Lord, and by doing that, we are built up. We are refreshed. We are edified. So there's a sense in which, yes, we do get grace, but we wouldn't call it a sacrament because, to me, again, that confuses the idea of the grace that you're talking about. And so um, we believe in the ordinance, that there are two ordinances. Uh, there are symbols of internal truths. And Jesus commanded in order his followers to be baptized and to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so for this reason alone, they're very important. And that, that it's a commemorative uh, occasion. That is, that the Lord's Supper, the church commemorates, remembers, celebrates, honors Christ's work of salvation for us. And so, let me just talk about this and I'll have to be done. Um, There's what is called open and closed communion. Open is when many churches allow all Christians, that is, baptized believers from any background, to participate in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Closed communion is when, you know, the church will limit those who can take the Lord's Supper. Now, let me just say here at Grace, we believe that if you are saved and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're walking in fellowship, you're certainly welcome to participate. So I guess that would kind of be filed under a 
open view. I like to call it even better close communion because anyone who is a believer and holds to salvation by faith, uh, grace through faith plus nothing, and you're walking in fellowship, we, we allow you to have it. We don't say to people, unless you're a member of our church, you can't take the Lord's Supper. Now, I remember when my first church I pastored um, the, uh, down in, in the south, uh, they were closed communion. And actually, I didn't know that. And when we, we were having the Lord's Supper one Sunday, and the man who was the brother of the founding pastor was there at church, and his daughter was visiting, and he brought his daughter to me. He said, Preacher, my daughter is asking if she can take the Lord's Supper. Will you please tell her? And I said, well, sure, you can take the Lord's Supper. And boy, he was mad that I said that. He actually wanted me to do his dirty work. He actually wanted me to say to her, you can't have the Lord's Supper here. He wasn't bold enough to tell her. He wanted me to tell her. And of course, I just said, of course, you can take the Lord's Supper. And he just kind of gave me a look like, you know, you can't tell her. She's not a member of this church. And later on, of course, he, he, he told on me. He told his uh, brother, the founding pastor, and so this man came to my office along with a president of a seminary down south, and they wanted to straighten me out on the Lord's Supper. And so they said, um, you can't let people who are not members take the Lord's Supper. I said, why not? I said, I don't see that in Scripture anywhere. Can you show it to me in the Bible? And they said, well, let's, let's put it to you like this. If you had a church business meeting, would you allow a visitor to vote in that business meeting? I said, absolutely not. They said, why not? I said, because they're not a member. They said, that's right. Well, why did you let them take the Lord's Supper? I said, well, to me, you're comparing apples and oranges. This is, we don't, we're, this is not a business meeting when we come together in the Lord's house. It's worship. It's worship. I can't tell someone that's coming to our church to worship. You can't worship with us. I said, let me ask you two guys a question. I said, if a visitor came, when a visitor came to your church during the time you pastored and you were having the Lord's Supper, I said, would you let them sing with you? Well, yeah. They, so they could sing the hymn if they weren't a member? Well, yeah. I said, well, could they pray with you? Well, they said, yes, of course. I said, well, let me ask you another question. If, you, if they put money in the offering plate, would you take it, even though they're not a member? And they said, well, of course. I said, so you're telling me that we'll let them sing, we'll let them pray, we'll take their money. But when we have the Lord's Supper, they can't participate with us. I said, all of that is worship. It's all worship. So we don't, you know, we don't have the communion police slapping cups out of people's hands saying you can't participate. We believe in, you know, there's nowhere in Scripture that forbids that. What we do do is we, we read 1 Corinthians 11 and we say, make sure that you're saved. Make sure that you're in fellowship with the Lord. And don't partake of this unworthily. Examine your own heart. And this is a time of communion between you and the Lord. And this is the time when you experience fellowship with our Savior. And we are blessed by it. We don't call it a sacrament. We're already saved. It doesn't give us any saving grace, but it sure does bless us. And it sure does remind us of Jesus. It reminds us of heaven. It reminds us of the Thanksgiving feast we're going to be participating in one day when we get to heaven. And so it's a, such an important ordinance. So we're out of time. Let's have a word of prayer together. Let's all stand together and pray, and we're going to have our service. So, Father, thank you for this wonderful worship time that you've prescribed for the church. I pray that it will be all the more meaningful to us. Um, as we think about all these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.